All right, pre 12, here we go. Let's get after it. We are going to do some identity proofs. So in section 7.1, we got a whole bunch of different trig identities. <clears throat> and you can use that list of identities to help you work your way through that. But what we're going to do in this case is now we're going to prove some identities. So here's some helpful hints. One, change your values into sine and cosine if you can, because it just makes it easier to work and find commonalities. Two, get a common denominator, because if you're dealing with fractions, you always want to have a common denominator. Consider factoring and using the conjugate. And then work with only one side of the equation at a time. You are not allowed to multiply the bo both sides by the same factor. It changes the initial uh, um, equality statement. You can only use identities to multiply individual sides. So let's just do a few of these and you can see them in action. So here we are. I'm going to prove this identity. I have cosecant squared minus 1 uh, over cosecant squared is equal to cos squared theta. That is given. The idea is now, can we make the two sides um, equal to one another? Can we prove that this is in fact true? So here's where we get some of our identities. So now I'm going to manipulate the left-hand side. I'm going to look at the cosecant squared minus 1, and I'm going to consider what identities do I have with cosecant. And I remember, and I look at my list, I have this identity. Cosecant squared is equal to 1 plus cotangent squared. So I can actually get this from this statement by subtracting 1 on both sides of this identity. So then I get the statement that cosecant squared theta minus 1 is equal to cotan squared theta. So that's going to be the change I make. So I'm going to be manipulating the left-hand side. So cosecant squared minus 1 is actually equal to cotangent squared theta. And then I have it over cosecant squared theta. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to convert things into cosine and sine values. So cotan is cos squared theta over sine squared theta. Cosecant is 1 over sine squared theta. And now that's division, so I'm going to flip and multiply. So I end up with cosecant squared theta over sine squared theta times sine squared theta over 1. You'll see my sine squared theta cancel out. And what am I left with? Cos squared theta, which is equal to my right hand side. So I have proved that identity. So what I've done is I've only manipulated the left hand side of the equation and then I have achieved the right hand side of the equation. That is a trig proof. So let's look at another. So in this scenario I have that tan x plus cotan x is equal to secant x times cosecant x. So remember work with one side at a time and general rule of thumb, it's helpful to work with the most complicated side first. But in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with my left-hand side. And I'm going to write that tan x is actually just sine x over cos x. And then cotan x is cos x over sine x. Now, in this scenario, this is one where I would get a common denominator. So I'm going to need a sine x times sine x on this piece and a cos x and cos x on this piece. So my left-hand side actually becomes sine squared x plus cos squared x over sine x times cos x. So now I have it all written over one denominator. And here I have one of our Pythagorean identities. So I'm going to stop my simplification of my left-hand side at 1 over sine x cos x. So now the question is, can I make my right-hand side the same? So Secant x is 1 over cos x. Cosecant x is 1 over sine x. So would you look at that? I'm already at 1 over sine x cos x. And I end up with left-hand side equals right-hand side. I have proved that identity. So <clears throat> this really is a puzzle. There's multiple ways you can approach these things. The idea is to just kind of play around and see if you can get there. And if you can't, erase it all, start again. That's the beauty. So let's look at another. Cosecant x plus cotan x equals sine over 1 minus cos x. So in this scenario, I'm going to work with my left-hand side first. Cosecant x is 1 over sine x. Cotan x is cos x over sine x x. I already have a common denominator, so on this side I get 1 plus cos x over sine x. Now, I can't just sort of look at this and know exactly where to go next, so I'm going to leave the left-hand side alone, 
And I'm going to start with the right hand side. And here's where a little bit of alarm bells. If you have a situation like this, you might want to consider the conjugate. So remember, multiplying by the conjugate is going to give us one of the um, one plus or minus cos or sine squared x scenarios because that's what we're going to get from the bottom and that allows us to get the Pythagorean identity. So what we get in this case is sine times the numerator. On the right we're going to have sine x because this multiplies in here and here plus sine x cos x. Now I multiply that in. You don't always have to do that. You'll see we might end up going backwards from there. So just consider the fact that yes you might multiply something in for some scenarios but you might not have to do it for others. On the bottom what we end up with is difference of squares sort of multiplied together now so we're foiling that out. We end up with 1 minus cos squared x. Now that is similar to our Pythagorean identity here, but if we subtract cos x from both sides, you get this. Now you'll find some of these identities really start to jump out at you, and this is the scenario we have. So we can actually change our denominator so that we have sine x plus sine x cos x is now over sine squared x. We've changed the 1 minus cos squared x. And now this is where you'll notice, yeah, you know what, multiplying that sine in was a bad idea. Because if I factor that sine back out, I have 1 plus cos x. And on the bottom, I have sine squared x. And I have a factor of sine that will cancel out on the top with the 1 on the bottom. So I end up with 1 plus cos x all over sine x, which is left-hand side equals right-hand side. So I've made it work. So let's do one more. We have tan squared x over 1 plus secant x equals 1 minus cos x over cos x. So again, I'm going to work with the more complicated side first. I'm going to start by working with my left-hand side. And my first proof is that I have a proof for tan squared x. Tan squared x is equal to, well, tan squared x plus 1 is equal to secant squared x. So that means that tan squared x is equal to secant squared x minus 1. So I'm going to write this now as secant squared x minus 1 over 1 plus secant x. Now you'll notice on the top here I have a difference of squares. So I will now write secant x plus 1 secant x minus 1. And this is all over 1 plus secant x. Now 1 plus secant x is exactly the same as secant x plus 1, so that's going to cancel with that. And what am I left with? I'm left with secant x minus 1. <clears throat> and I'm looking for this. Well, what's secant x minus 1? Secant x minus 1 is 1 over cos x minus 1. But the beauty here is this 1, this 1 right here. 1 can always be written as anything over itself, and if you look at the right-hand side of our equation, we have a denominator of cos. So 1, instead of 1 here on the right, I can write it as cos x over cos x, which gives me now 1 minus cos x over cos x, which, lo and behold, is equal to my right-hand side. And I'm done my identities. So for these identities, I got a few more of the notes, but then you have a whole bunch of ones to practice. Remember things like difference of squares, factoring, um, conjugate when necessary. Use all the identities, play around with them. They are they can be challenging. Oftentimes you'll only need to manipulate one side of the equation. Many times you can manipulate one side until you almost hit like a stick point, and then you'll start the second side. But really play around, have fun with these. That's what they're all about. They're about solving this puzzle. So thank you so much, and I will see you next time.